This week on the Eldritch Lawcast. Unless there's some regulation in 1D and D, magic items are going to continue to be problematic. It seemed, uh, you know, serviceable, mm. which is not the sort of glowing review I want to give. Note to self, Ms. Pac Man, the RPG. Look at this though. James is back in his jungle. Big baby, Dale. You're a big baby. I'm not trying to trash this documentary before it happens. Say Kickstarter. Kickstarter, mate. Kickstarter. Go on. <laughs> no, Ben knows something. If you have a bonus action and a swift action and a move action and a free action and two regular actions, now you are adding to that latency. If I can't figure out the general gist of it, then we start to hit a problem, right? All that and more right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, the most pan-national podcast in all the planes, or so I assume. I think pan-national is the right word for, like, multinational. I don't know. I don't know uh, ge- geographic words. I don't even know if that's geographic. Anyway, my name's Ben Byrne, uh, and I am here, as always, with Sean Merwin, Dale Kingsmill, James Hake, and James, we have a, co- a question, a comment, a question, both of those things are from from Wamp- R- Wampant Wombat, uh, Rampant Wombat. Wampant Wombat. Uh, He's very, who- very quiet. <laughs> and he's in Wombats. <laughs> uh, who I've noticed is also in the Twitch chat, but they asked on our YouTube channel, uh, what is your favorite outer plane to play a D&D campaign on if you are if you are to set it somewhere Ooh. other than the mortal realm? For one thing, can I just say, I didn't see a single Wombat while I was in Australia. Non-captivity. None the wild. I was in Tasmania for a whole week. Not one wombat. I saw an endangered spotted quoll while I was in Tasmania before I saw a wombat. Anyway, your actual Someday question. Someday we'll get you a wombat. We'll get you a wombat, James. I want to see the wombat. I don't even know what a wombat looks like. I've, I haven't looked up a picture, uh, not on Google, and I kind of want to remain unspoiled for the moment so that just, I actually You're see aware. Wait, do you not know what wombats look like? Not in the slightest. I, I have a sort of vague understanding that they're kind of like a big... For, furry dome that kind of walks around. That's an yeah. excellent description. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm. But yep. uh, anyway, basically a speed planes. bump from hell. <laughs> <laughs> like you do um, not want to go over a wombat. This, uh, this answer dates back to high school to my first ever DM, who is now my housemate who I, I live with. Um, the best outer plane is um oh my gosh i can't even remember its actual name because i only know it as the battle cubes acheron it's acheron i'm thinking of the battle cubes the uh the plane of metallic cubes that sort of float in space i think i'm thinking of acheron uh where hobgoblins and other goblinoids sort of fight in eternal combat on uh these uh <laughs> Euclidean geometric objects as they float through space. Um, I don't even really have a solid reason for it other than the battle cubes kind of sticks in my <laughs> mind. Uh, it's, 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 plenty you know, it's, it's great. Plenty I can imagine reason. as a DM having a portal kind of open up in a dungeon and you're kicked on to Acheron, one sort of one cube of Acheron, maybe a little cube, some, you know, quarter mile on all dimensions where you're kind of put through a gauntlet of tests as you're trying to get back to wherever you came from, kind of Super Mario Galaxy style, wandering, wandering around, dealing with weird gravity effects as goblins and other beasties come at you from all sides, just as sort of like a little encapsulated encounter to deal with before you get back to the usual thing. Uh, there's just something so distinct about being on a cube full of things that want to kill you and trying to find your way back home. That really speaks to me about the outer planes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, great. I, I have the no idea. cubes! <laughs> I have no idea what Acheron's meant to look like, but from your description, I'm just imagining like some early 2000s, like the Spawn movie version (laughs) of hell with these low rendered like geometric cubes just kind of floating in space, but they're all red and muscly uh, for no reason whatsoever. Um, Speaking of outer planes, Dale Kingsmill, uh, what is your favorite outer plane to play on? When I knew that this question was coming, I had to go and look up what the hell the Outer Planes are again because <laughs> it's one of those things where I'm just so not up on the law. Yeah. And so examining the list, I'm sure it's not going to come as a surprise to anybody, but I think I have to say Hades. 
things. Um, I saw it on the list and I was like, well then, because I do kind of have in the back of my head, there's a, there's a Theros game that I've wanted to run for a while, which is just that there are these people in that setting called the returned who basically escaped from not, not technically Hades, but Erebus. Um, and they, you know, don't remember who they are. So I've always wanted to run one campaign. That's a bunch of characters who, for whatever reason, are desperate to escape, uh, Erebus and, and they want to, you know, they've got their unfinished business. And so you finish up the campaign with them escaping and then start up another campaign with a different group of people playing the same character sheets, but with all of the character history wiped out because they can't remember who they are. And so they just come in and they're like, well, I guess I'm a rogue. I've got these skills. I don't know what's happening, but cool. And they have to figure <laughs> out what the hell their unfinished business was. I've always wanted to do that. Nice, nice. Uh, Sean Merwin, uh, your preferred outer plane to play D&D on? I, I love me some hell, I have to admit. Woo, uh, hell! Well, there, there's actually two, right? There, there's the nine hells and then there's Mechanus, and they're both- You can't say there's two be... hells and then say there's nine, Sean. Goodness gracious. There's two hells. One of them there's, is nine hells. <laughs> there's two hells living in all of us. No, there, there's two planes that I like, but both sort of for similar reasons. The the They're both, both Mechanus and the nine hells are, are lawful. And for some reason, maybe it's the players that I'm attracted to or that are attracted to me. They love to be the force of chaos within the the world that seems to make sense. And both of those realms, the Nine Hells, it's it's dangerous, but there's there's a system to it. And you can insert characters into that system and see what kind of havoc they can wreak and make deals with one devil against another devil. So I, I like that. It's one of the safer places to to play in the outer planes while that seems quite uh <laughs> counterintuitive it's much better than where the demons right the infinite abyss where you you go and you're just putting at that point uh but mechanus is so funny because it takes this it takes this idea of the perfect mechanical lawful place where everything is just so and as soon as you put characters in there you can just show the chaos effect of everything going completely haywire with the smallest thing that the characters might do. And characters are very not good at doing small things. They're good at doing big things. So <laughs> you can really have watch the whole plane fall apart because someone drops their dagger you know, or you know, something strange like that. It's you can make fun stories uh, with that. Speaking of mechanical things, uh, let us crack into the news this week. Uh, we have uh, a, a video game. That's that's the mechanical connection. Uh, a video <laughs> game uh, which is coming, which yeah. Wizards of the Coast are, I suppose, probably funding based on the fact that they bought a studio, uh, which is called Invoke Studios, um, which if you don't recognize that name, it's because they changed their name after they got purchased by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, so they are now Invoke Studios. I can't remember. Did I, uh, I did not write down what they were previously known as, but they had worked Toke. on. Thank you. Uh, I mm -hmm. didn't know how to pronounce that either. I didn't know whether it was Took or Tuku or, or how to, or Tucker. Um, anyway, uh, they worked on Dark Alliance, which was the previous D and D game that dropped, and I did not hear great things about. I know we're sort of mid tier, like video game fans on this podcast. Generally speaking, did anybody delve into Dark Alliance and has great or terrible things to say about it? I I watched some gameplay videos of it, um, but generally that kind of game is not my cup of tea to begin with. Um, sure. And yeah, it, it seemed, uh, you know, serviceable, mm. which is not the sort of glowing review I want to give a video game. It seemed very like it was an odd choice for a D and D. Well, actually, maybe it made perfect sense. Choice for a D and D game in terms of just being like a dungeon delving loot game where you go on runs. It's like multiplayer. You pick one of four characters. You kind of go through a pre-made dungeon. You loot it, and then you upgrade your character for the next run and it's kind of this repetitive semi-repetitive kind of thing it's not really a narrative game was my takeaway from yeah, what i understood like, of it. it it seems like a sort of uh gauntlet ish diablo ish dungeon mm. dungeon basher and the sort of thing that that might 
work really well given the uh, runaway success of Supergiant's Hades uh, from 2020, which was game of the year from a lot of different places. But mm. I, I think I'm the thing so that- sorry, but Ben just twitched so much and I have to draw attention to it. <laughs> it was incredible. You said it's a bit like Hades and it was a party on Ben's face of emotions. <laughs> oh, well, I'm. <laughs> l- let me talk a little bit more, and then then I want to get to uh, sure. w- the the reason behind Ben's twitch. <laughs> it's just that I, I think the reason why a game like Hades, which you know in in its broadest stroke sounds quite similar, it's a dungeon delver that you you know gain upgrades over the course of playing many times, and it's kind of repetitive, and you do it over and over again. That game why that game might've been successful while Dark Alliance was not, is that uh, the sort of game of the year aspects of Hades, in addition to just being an incredibly tightly designed bit of roguelite action, is that there was a story that unfolded over the course of its many runs. Mm. You know, there's there's purpose behind the runs. It's not just sort of throw yourself into the meat grinder over and over again for no reason. Um, and again, from my limited window into Dark Alliance, that seems to have not been the case. Anyway, <laughs> that, that Twitch bet. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I, I have played other Supergiant games. I did not get around to playing Hades because I, I uh, uh, by reputation, don't really like roguelikes um, of that, like, repetitive gameplay. But folks have recommended Hades to me so much. Uh, I, I need to make time to eventually sit down and play it because it seems to have, despite being a roguelike going back to the start, kind of again and again, like you said, James, uh, uh, an expanding narrative where... Um, basically to my understanding, Hades, who is the main character who you play as dad, every time you oh. die, <laughs> okay, you, we got, you, the dad yeah, yeah no, we got okay. there. Yeah. Uh, every time you die, you go back to Hades, like you would in Greek mythology. And he's just like, ah, oh, you, you came back again, huh? Like, it's not like a, it's not like a reset on the game. It's more kind of built into the narrative of the game yeah, that you go right, back right. to the, the one might call it, it and- Sisyphean. <laughs> a character who does in fact show up in that game and is quite amenable you to your plight for obvious reasons <laughs> yes I, I i should make an effort but i thought it was an, an an interesting comparison because admittedly i haven't played dark alliance either because it held no interest for me because it seemed like this very um you know i don't want to say cash grabby um um sort of game because all games are intended to make money in some capacity right but this being a licensed game the specific comparison to hades which is made by supergiant who are kind of known for making these very artisanal like tightly crafted very specific sort of uh narrative games that are built around mechanics that they were like hey this could be fun let's experiment with this um i loved the 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 hell out of transistor and i really Really did enjoy Pyre as well. Um, and then you compare it to this, like, you know, licensed game that to my perception was clearly there. Like, I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe Dark Alliance and someone in the chat can correct or uh, correct me or affirm, uh, had like loot boxes and things like that to kind of like upgrade your character in different ways. Um, and so anyway, all this speculation is to say, like, I'm curious to know what the newly renamed Invoke Studios AAA game is going to be because, you know, Wizards bought them. They clearly want them to make something successful that's D&D related. Um, It's not going to be Baldur's Gate 3 because we, pardon me, we know where Baldur's Gate 3 is, but is that going, is it going to be another dungeon crawler or are they going to try something else like Dark Alliance or are they going to try something completely new again? I think there's there's reason to be hopeful. Um, well, I think a lot of us remember the scourge of licensed games of the early 2000s as sort of movie tie-ins of shovelware quality ad infinitum. Um it has been seen that uh, an RPG studio can license out small bits of their IP to a number of video game developers in the way that Wizard seems to be starting to do and mm-hmm. have it do quite well. Uh, games Workshop licensed out uh, sort of parcels of the 40K, Warhammer 40,000 brand to a lot of different studios. And while a lot of those games were sort of mobile games of no real repute. There there were some really good titles out of there. Even I, a not 40K player, knows of Vermintide and Vermintide mm. 2. Very good sort of Left 4 Dead-ish 
uh, games involving the Skaven, I believe, uh, and fighting against them. Um, also, not 40k. Uh, War oh, it's Warhammer Fantasy, Fantasy and yeah. or Age yeah. of Sigma, but they have. I think it's called Dark Tide, <laughs> uh, which is the new 40k <laughs> version. Anyway, sorry. Go on. <laughs> no, Ben knows something here. Yeah, yeah. Ben can talk about this much better than I can. But there's some <laughs> action. There- Somehow was so scathing. Ben knows something. <laughs> <laughs> I did, um, actually, James. To be fair, sort of, so yeah, he gets tur- away. Turnabout's fair play here. I can damn you with faint praise. <laughs> so it's just what, like watching fencing <laughs> happening with uh, reposts and everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, uh, even I, who knows nothing about Warhammer knows that Vermintide's a pretty good game and that that is one of the many licensed properties that has come out of, uh, Games Workshop giving their brand to, uh, other developers to sort of play in the sandbox with. I do think it's interesting. So Zach Naum is in the chat and says, I actually worked for the publisher for Dark Alliance. It definitely wasn't well liked by the community reviewers, streamers. Um, and that is interesting because there have been many D D video games in the past they come up they come up they happen i have strong memories of playing ones that didn't replicate the dice rolling as i have recently learned some do uh you can find it on a previous episode of the law cast and i it, my uh, yeah. brain explodes on camera um but you know it is interesting uh to pick this 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 development studio who maybe maybe there were maybe there were stronger studios uh that that have made D games <laughs> in the past yes but, but less easily acquirable studios right, i would have there assumed it is. so then there's that question of balance right like how important is it to be making your own game uh with a studio that you own versus just licensing it out like like you can you can make money licensing it out so what sure. is what what is the like deeper purpose of this? And it it is possible Dante is also in chat and has pointed out that it's possibly connected to the virtual tabletop stuff uh, since they are using game engines to I, create them. I wouldn't think so, uh, only because this seems to be presented as a separate kind of news item. It hasn't been connected to one D&D at all, and it is b- being said that they're developing a triple A um, video game, which if folks aren't down on their video game lingo in the chat, or watching this it podcast means basically means like good. Hollywood quality, like, you know, top of the line. That's a uh, bold claim, what? Dale. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, last 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 year, the CEO of, of Hasbro, who was the president of Wizards, mm. said that they were working on as many as six video games from mm. various companies. And if you go to the Wizards of the Coast website and you click on jobs, you will see help wanted at at no oh, more yeah. than four different game video game companies that are either owned by Wizards or owned by Hasbro or are in some working arrangement. Mm-hmm. There's Archetype Entertainment, which is in Austin, Texas, former Bioware uh, leaders that moved over and are working on what they say on their website is a multi-platform role-playing game set in a brand new science fiction universe. So there's there's a game coming out of Wizards that's not D and D. We have Invoke Studios, which we just talked about. There's some a, outfit called Skeleton Key, also in Austin, Texas. Not sure what they're working on. And Atomic Arcade is in North Carolina working on a AAA GI Joe role playing game. This company is owned by Wiz- Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro. So, and that's not even D and D, right? So I don't know if if Chris Cox. If those games, the the San, uh, the science fiction game or the GI Joe game, are even included in that six that he talked about, Archetype is a really interesting one. I, I had to immediately Google as soon as you mentioned they were in Austin, Texas, Sean, because uh, I was curious if, and I was correct, some members of Archetype Studios are former Retro Studios members, also in Austin, Texas, studio who is formerly a second who is a second party of Nintendo. Retro Studios is famous for making Metroid Prime and Donkey Kong Country Returns, which means that these people have some real serious pedigree working as a second party, which is exactly what they'd be doing for Wizards of the Coast, taking an IP that they do not own and making a really top quality game based within that existing framework. Um, And Metroid Prime and DKC Returns are like, really well beloved games at this point so they've got they've got the talent at archetype to make uh top-notch games 
Uh, and it's really actually very exciting to see that Wizards has them uh, in their pocket. I also kind of feel the same about uh, Invoke in terms of like, I, I try not to judge um, uh, game studios too much on their previous outings, uh, especially if they've only had one well-known one before, because often studios kind of who are known for doing one type of game will come along and just blow you were away with something entirely new that that you would not have thought have come out of that studio before. I'm trying to think of an example, but I can't off the top of my head, and so I'll probably get it wrong if I try to. What would you want to see in a Dungeons and Dragons game, video game specifically? I should say. I mean, look for me, I my fondest memory of a D and D based video game was one that was um, very focused on sort of. I don't even know what you would call this genre of game, but, um, you know, I guess party tactics, right? But where you can play multiplayer. This is very old school now that I'm stopping and saying it out loud. You can play multiplayer up to four players or whatever, but you could also, as in, as a single player, swap between the characters. So in the style of X-Men Legends or, you know, I guess um, Dragon Age Origins, where a lot of it is... Um, figuring out the sort of autopilot tactics for the characters that you're not playing at at the time or, you know, teaming up with your friends uh, for couch co-op or what have you. I loved playing games like that. And I think that there's a lot of room for games like that now that is not necessarily being filled. Um, Speaking of game genres that haven't been filled, uh, D&D once had a very great arcade beat-em-up called D&D Shadows of Mystara. Um, that was developed by a Japanese Great developer, game. very anime styled. Look up the characters from D and D Shadows of Mistara. Uh, they're really cool. They're really evocative. Um, if you insist, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're they're rad. Um, and you know, I don't know it would be how cool. to spell Mistara. Oh, it's like M Y S T A R A. The story oh, was like you. the oldest of the old D and D settings, the known world. Really, really classic pre-Greyhawk, if I have my history right. I think D&D video games are at their best when they're doing all sorts of wild stuff. You know, do CRPGs like Dale was talking about. Do side-scrolling arcade beat-em-ups like the old Shadow of Mistara. Do, I don't know, do a sort of Life is Strange-esque visual novel using D&D stuff. Do do, do all of it. Um, mm. And I imagine that with Wizards getting six studios, they can't just all be doing the same sort of Baldur's Gate-style thing. Uh, mm. They got to be doing, you know, some of them have to be little mobile games that have, you know, do a D&D gotcha game. You know, I, <laughs> would I play it? I don't know. But it's it's just cool to see the D&D brand permeating a bunch of different genres so that no matter what kind of player you are, you've got something to to fill your time and scratch that D&D itch when you're sure. not playing. I mean, I would like to play a D&D RPG in the vein of like folks keep calling out uh, or they were Mass Effect in the Twitch chat mm. earlier, mm-hmm. which the original trilogy is an amazing RPG. My problem with like Larian Studio style uh, RPGs and and there's another uh, company that was doing similar sort of stuff that I can't think of off the top of my head. But I bounce like Pillars of Eternity, those style games. I bounce off them so quickly because they're trying to invoke old school RPGs so much, I just, I can't, they're not cinematic enough for me. I can't kind of feel as invested in them. I Plus feel there are like, certain quality of life changes that have happened over time that I, I can't, won't go back. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And I feel like, you know, what Mass Effect does is, uh, you know, it, it's Skewing got no- has its limits. <laughs> <laughs> it's got uh, no ties to D&D, obviously, but it's a game where they figured out how to make the shooting in that game and the and the combat and the the social mechanics fun, kind of informed probably by years of, of tabletop role playing game developments. Um, but it was like a video game first, and I feel like if they were to do a and D RPG, what I would really want to see is something that was a video game first with a and D license, rather than something that was trying to capture literally D and D and put that into a video game. Because at that point, I'd rather just go play D&D. There was a D&D video game that was trying to capture the magic of Baldur's Gate that flopped hard. And I can't quite remember what it was. Chat's trying. Neverwinter Nights, Divinity. More suggestions <laughs> of Neverwinter Nights. Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Ms. Pac-Man. Oh, yeah. that. You know what? That, that is a real dungeon crawler. Yeah. There's ghosts and everything. D&D and Ms. Pac-Man. 
They're pretty, pretty similar. They're pretty similar. I mean, they're, they're, games. they're really alike deep down. Yeah. They're definitely really? games, that's for sure. Note to self, Ms. Pac-Man, the RPG. Sword Coast <laughs> Legends. That's what it is. A 2015 uh, action role playing game. Sword Coast Legends. Um, it, it was prominent for having a mode in which you could, as a dungeon master, create your, your dungeon in the game and then run your players for it. That was kind of its big, look at how much like d- digital D&D you can play with this game. And that mode didn't work very well. And the main game wasn't very compelling. And it just it did not make any impact. Yeah, Which is why sure. I just can't remember the name. I mean, maybe maybe we're slowly getting there with the way the virtual tabletops are kind of, I suppose, introducing automations and things yeah. that, you know, it's a, it's a hard thing to force. It's Joe Manganello is creating a D&D documentary which I'm not sure, I I couldn't find this out in the reporting, the specifics of this, whether it is being funded and produced by Wizards and Hasbro or whether it is just being like supported by them and Joey's kind of found his own funding for it because his his production team seemed to largely be himself uh, and his friends and family. Um, but some excellent uh, uh, sort of talent uh, on there as well. Uh, so they're producing uh, with Carl Newman, who was one of the uh, writers on the Art and Arcana sort of D&D history <sighs> book, uh, are producing a documentary for 2024, the game's 50th anniversary, that will apparently feature uh, some of over 400 hours of unseen archived D&D footage stretching back to the 80s. Uh, and Wizards of the Coast are giving them inside access to highly confidential information in regards to the brand. I feel like 400 hours of unsi- uh, unseen archive D&D footage is just a bunch of dudes sitting around playing D&D. Like, is that... Mm-hmm. Well, what is yeah, that like, footage? Surely Gary Gygax was <laughs> not taping himself playing D&D with his friends, right? Who knows? Surely not. They did have video cameras back then, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> But no, <laughs> I I am as as a as a person who loves history. I am both intrigued and horrified by this. <laughs> okay, uh, b- because that's I I fear that that's what it is. Right? It's I don't think Wizards is directly involved except to uh, give give Joe access to the, this this information and this footage. Mm. Uh, I would love it to be short. I would love it to be pithy, uh, but it, I fear it will contain the two things that I don't want to see, which is celebrities t- telling me about D&D. I mm-hmm. already know about d and I don't need to be told by celebrities about D&D. And uh, old grainy footage of, of the TSR offices, uh, which great if you work there and you know want to relive that but i've already had books that have told me everything i need to know about tsr back in the day so for people that will enjoy this i think it's going to be great i don't know if i'm on that list yeah i think i've got bad news for you sean i think it's going to have celebrities telling you about D and probably exactly. old grainy footage of the old yeah. tsr offices because okay here's the thing uh and i mean okay i Several of you uh, during the Melbourne trip were subject to these kinds of conversations already, but chat, (laughs) buckle up. This is your first ride. Let me tell you about J-pop for a minute. So it's no coincidence, for example, looking at (laughs) the Johnny's Entertainment Company in Japan (laughs) that they have released all kind of at the same time, right? Their their biggest band, their flagship band, my favourite band, Arashi, uh, you know, kind of started breaking into the US market around the same time that they decide to put on an Arashi documentary and a series, a documentary series about Johnny's Juniors up on Netflix, accessible to Western audiences. At the same time as they send Travis Japan to go and compete on America's Got Talent, it's also no accident that it, that we're seeing this with D&D, right? That we're lining up the release of one D&D with yeah. the 50th anniversary with this documentary release, right? And we can say, oh, yes, con- this is this is highly confidential material. No, it's not. It's material that you're going to release in 2024. It might technically be highly confidential right now, but it's not like we will be getting a secret glimpse into, into the you know deep underbelly of D&D when the documentary releases. It'll be stuff that they are happy to release come 2024. It's not actually gonna be a secret at that point in time. Um, and then the idea of archive footage, like I, I'm curious, like, was it 
Was it footage that was archived somewhere? Is there an archive or does it just mean this is footage that we've been able to scrounge up by asking lots of people who are yeah. around throughout the, the lifetime of D&D whether they have footage of stuff? Uh, you know, and I, it is it is interesting, right? Is it just going to be grainy footage of the TSR officers? Because <laughs> when you think about like Get Back, right, we've got this archive footage of the Beatles and there's a lot of it and it is very long and it is mostly them sitting around. And that's the Beatles. This is not the Beatles. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see what the product is. But I suspect, much in the vein of the uh, of the Johnny's Entertainment Group documentary series that we're seeing on Netflix at the moment, I love J-pop. Um, <laughs> we also are going to be getting a product that is basically a documentary trying to introduce people who don't really know about yeah. D&D to D&D. Yeah, this is not going to be hard-hitting investigative journalism. Um this is not a Ken Burns documentary in the waiting. I think what we really need to know is who is this documentary for? And I do suspect it's what you said, Dale, which is this is for people who have just gotten into D&D, are really interested in D&D, and want to know about the history of D&D, and kind of want to see the shiny version of it. They're not going to go delving into the kind of grimier history of it that we see in some of the books that have come out over the past 10 years. Sure. Or certainly the more dramatic version of mm. it, the the heightened version of it, um, mm -hmm. which is fine. You know, it's just it's just clever tent polling, really. You know, if you look at the Art and Arcana book and, uh, you know, Joe Manganiello as his, his general uh, online personality around D&D, those things definitely, yeah, they're not hard hitting. They don't go into the the seedy underbelly of like the the legal battles that have unfolded over D and D throughout the years, and the the sort of changing of hands of who was in control. That. I reckon we will get that because really? that's that's the heightened drama. That's the dramatic right. story that you can tell about mm. D and D, right? That'll get people interested for sure. I mean, I I hope that it's kind of you know, uh, if nothing else, a real celebration of the game, and people can look at like who who are new to the game can look at the old drawings of beholders and mind flayers and go, ah, look at that, that looks weird. Um, which was basically my reaction to Art and Arcana uh, the entire way through. Um, but and it could be great. I feel like I just trashed on it. It could be great. Oh, I I, I think I, I think I'm gonna watch it. <laughs> I think you're all right in it, like entirely. Uh, my defense of it is I think it will be enjoyable uh, for sure. But, you know, even I've managed to find some pretty good and I assume good because, you know, I don't have a lot of research to compare them against. But like YouTube documentaries that have gone on deep dives into the history of D&D &D, um, and the history of TSR and how Wizards got hold of the, the company uh, or the IP rather, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just kind of curious. I can't remember any of their names off the top of my head, but you've all uh, kind of shouted out books. I'm just kind of curious, Sean, like what are some books that you could recommend that people go and find right now if they want to, if, if they're legitimately interested in learning about this stuff uh, and not just watching a documentary with, with celebrities in it? Uh, now you're going to have me searching the internet. Uh, <laughs> on the other podcast I do, I actually interviewed uh, the gentleman who wrote the most recent book who actually got the, the, uh, financials from TSR. Mm. So you could tell exactly how many books were being sold back then, which is the first time anyone has gotten access to that. And it's Benjamin Riggs. And I cannot remember the name of the, his book off the top of my head, Was but if you look up Benjamin the Riggs. Slaying the Dragon? Slaying the Dragon, yes. Is that it? But there's Of Dice and Men, and there's John Peterson, who is an executive producer on the movie, has several uh books on this topic uh so yeah it's all out there and i'm not trying to to trash this documentary before it happens with the beatles you were not there to you could hear their albums but you were not there and to to see what they were like back then whereas D D, you can go anywhere and find actual plays and find four completely brilliant and wonderful people talking about it in grim detail on any random Monday night slash Tuesday morning, just off the top of my head. <laughs> so right, it, it's exactly what audience is this trying to, to connect with? And I hope it connects well and brings in millions of new players. Fair. That's always because I like money. <laughs> if, um, if you're interested in a really good history, not just of D&D, &D, but the entire context from which the RPG industry was born and what it grew into, I can't recommend highly enough 
uh, Shannon Applekline's Designers and Dragons. Um, mm -hmm. It's a four book series that goes from the 70s to uh, it used to be the now, but now kind of the 2010s. Um, the first book, if you care about Dungeons and Dragons, uh, is just a gold mine of seeing like kind of what the soup that D and D, the primordial broth that D and D was birthed from, was really very interesting. And then kind of how that that branch grows and twists as you know, vampire becomes the new hotness in the '90s, and you know, indie games become the new hotness, and the OOS and the, the SRD happens, and it, it's very cool if you're interested in the the grand overarching histories of RPGs. And stuff like that. Highly recommend it. <laughs> emails. Uh, if you're a listener with a question, you can email those through to podcast at ghostfiregaming.com uh, where I do keep them in a big vat and I reach in and I pull them out uh, to make sure that that we can read them out. Um, and I also don't, like, they're not necessarily, uh, email questions are like wines. They they age nicely. So if you don't hear your question come up sort of the week you emailed it through, you might hear it a month and a half later, as may be the case with Lars, whose question, uh, Lars is trying to get into Pathfinder 2nd Edition, uh, and I think we've talked about how to get into new systems before, but there were a couple of questions here comparing Pathfinder to 5e that I thought might be interesting around um, do, does a more complex rules system hinder free flow storytelling? Um, does it hinder the GM's ability to kind of uh, make things up to, to, to you know, uh, uh, insert into the story? I know there's certain systems in Infinity, the role-playing game that I've read, which is like, you know, a GM has a resource that they spend to add more goons to a fight, whereas in 5e it's very much like, this fight's too easy. I'm going to add more goons to it. You know, uh, how much freedom should, should a GM feel to add goons uh, randomly to a fight if there's a system in play for it? Um, are these systems flexible enough to improvise like 5e can? Uh, James Hake, I haven't started with you today. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to give the best answer I can, given that I'm not a Pathfinder second edition aficionado. I, I think what the bulk of this question is driving at is should he switch systems? Is is the sort of newness, the mechanical sharpness, the mechanical uh, customizability of Pathfinder Second Edition worth switching away from the tried and true uh, and well known to the DM Fifth Edition? And to that, I say you got to play the game that you think you'll have the most fun running. If there's some new allure to Pathfinder 2nd Edition, play a one-shot or two of it. Um, and you know, just like with any new game system you're going to get into, you have to go into it with the understanding that you and your players are going to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, it's not going to be perfect by a long shot. And so I... Uh, Go in and look for the things that will highlight what you think is fun and fresh about Pathfinder 2, and uh, just don't stress the small stuff. I know that's kind of a weird thing to say when, to be perfectly honest, playing Pathfinder 2 instead of 5th edition is kind of all about the small stuff. Um, the reason why you would play it is you want a sort of mechanical difference, because they both kind of try to play the same type of game of, mm. of fantasy action. Do your best. Learn the rules as they come up. I think that's the best thing to do. Okay. So I'm going, here we go. Sean's pontification <laughs> time. Pull up yeah. a chair. All right. So let's think of role-playing games as an hourglass. So in the top globe, you have everything. Uh, you have the rules. You have the characters. You have the player inputs. And you can make that as complex or as simple as you want. At some point, it has to go through the little throat. And that's where you're actually taking all those rules and you're turning those rules, those inputs into a story. The story then flows out into the bottom globe. All role playing games are doing is messing around, especially if iterations of DD like Pathfinder is. All they're doing is messing around with how much sand is there how big the top globe is and how narrow or wide the throat is. There's, there's a concept that I like to talk about in role-playing games called latency. Latency is 
you're telling a story with your friends. The DM is giving you, uh, giving you the details of the scene and you're asking questions. And then at some point you have to say, what do you do? And you tell them what you do and you check the rules and you roll dice and a story will come out. Latency is how much time does it take between getting to that story after you decide what you're going to do? And so latency can be the, the, the width of that throat in the hourglass. Now, if you have just one action that you can do on your turn, it's going to move pretty quickly. Uh, you're going to say, I want to attack it. I want to cast a spell. I want to run over here. Boom, you roll a die or just say, okay, you're done. And then you move on. And the story changes based on that. If you have a bonus action and a swift action and a move action and a free action and two regular actions, now you are adding to that latency. You are putting more distance between the narrative that you've created at the top and the story that's going to flow out at the bottom. So think about that as you get into more complex games. If your players are cool with that complexity, if you want that math, if you're okay with that latency of figuring out all the little pluses and minuses, then you will probably be cool with Pathfinder 2, which is all about adding and subtracting modifiers and making all of these decisions. If you want a quicker flowing game, then you probably don't want to move in that direction. If you want your narrative to flow more naturally, rather than going into the game side of things, but going into the storytelling side of things, then you want you know less clutter in the throat of your hourglass. You want it to go quicker. You don't want all that math and all of those decisions that have to happen on your turn. That's the best advice I can give. Oh my, I feel like I've learned things. I'm so happy in this moment right now. Thank you, Sean. I'm so happy we have someone we who didn't teaches even have classes on game design on this podcast. I know, right? <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, um, yeah, I got, I got nothing like especially great to add to that. I guess um, to answer the question that was in the email, like d does a game that is more complex uh, hinder your ability to tell a, a sort of narrative focused story? I don't think it does. Um, does it kind of create more barriers to entry for new players or players who are new to the system? Absolutely. Absolutely it does. And that's why you can do things like what James was talking about. You can have your danger room sessions where you're really just learning the system and how it works. Um, but no, Sh Sean is absolutely right. That That's the perfect analogy. I really loved it. I think the other thing that having a, a complex um, sort of crunchy system does is that it take something that ordinarily would be very up in the air, right? You're like, I don't know what to do in this situation. So we have to figure out together, DM and players, how this is going to, you know, run during the game. And it does give you sort of this safety net. The, the attempt is we're going to cover all these bases in the rules so that there is something that you can look up and there is a definitive answer to it. Um, and that has its pros and its cons. And I think in terms of its effect on the narrative, it makes it um, a little bit more like you versus the system, right? Like th there are absolutes in play that um, that make it sort of that emergent storytelling where you can't necessarily control as much of the story because, you know, it is absolutely true that that goblin is behind half cover and so therefore they get this much bonus to their AC, but then this is, you know, like th there is more constraint on the story, but in a way that um, emphasizes the same thing that happens when you roll the dice, right? You roll the dice and that, that gives fate a hand in the story that you can't control. And this is just giving more of that to the system than maybe exists in, in a simpler, less crunchy game system. Crunchier systems for me as well. I mean, someone that comes from a war gaming background. And so sometimes I quite enjoy a little bit of crunch in my game. Uh, and I've been thinking, you know, I've been reading the Witcher role playing game again recently after PAX, I picked up a couple of the supplements. So I've been comparing that to 5e again, which is fairly uh, crunchy. Um, Witcher <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, uh, uh, the thing about like a crunchy system for me and the difference between like just making up, you know, a story without rules is that you can feel good in a, uh, or you can feel good at a role playing game. You can feel like you are the skilled sword fighter that, uh, your character represents because you know how to use the rules of your character to overcome the barriers that are placed in front of you, such as that goblin being in half cover 
or that, uh, you know, the, the, the wizard who's casting a spell and you hit it with counter spell means that, yeah, I picked that because I, I wanted to be able to feel like I'm in a wizard's duel with this other wizard. And so I want to be able to, I've used the rules to tell the story in a way that makes me feel like I am that wizard, uh, rather than just sort of saying, uh, I do this and it happens because I say it does, right? The rules enforce the reality of the game world or the story world that you're playing within. And something that's less crunchy by comparison, like 5e, if a goblin's in half cover, you have a plus, you know, if a goblin's in half cover and I have sharpshooter, that means that I have, uh, I ignore that half cover so I, I can just roll normally. I don't have any penalties on my dice roll against that goblin. And we've discussed on this podcast before whether that makes you feel more skilled as a player of the game to over to, to just have a bonus on the dice as you roll it, right? Whether as in The Witcher, I can take an aimed shot which has its own penalties and does create more of that latency, as Sean was saying, but has the feeling that I made a decision that meant that I hit the goblin with my arrow rather than just it was the luck of the dice that informed whether or not I hit or not. And so that helps fulfill the... um, I'm curious, Sean, if you feel the success of 5e has... Uh, been helped in you know uh, aside from you know it's excellent marketing and stranger things and all all that you know critical role all that tertiary stuff that kind of has helped it along the way the popularity of it has kind of also uh, uh in some way been attributed to the fact that it seems to as you're describing that hourglass uh, and latency sort of um situation 5e seems to sit in a really fine balanced place between something like a Pathfinder and something like a um, Fiasco, which Fiasco is very much like this happens because I say it does. You know, there are some rules to it, but really it is just uh, we, we're making a story here together without too many dice rolls. Do you feel that 5e sits in, like that's part of its success is it sits really nicely in the middle of that that spectrum? Yeah, I think so. I think most of the success i think came from streaming which allowed people to see the bottom of the hourglass and what right. could be done there before they learned all of the chaos that goes on at the top of the hourglass <laughs> so i think that was the main thing but the game did get out of its own way enough to make it f- fairly simple for players to at least get the basics down of Roll a d20, you're going to add your modifier to it, you're shooting for this number, and then we'll move on. So don't worry about half cover. Don't worry about three quarters cover. Don't worry about taking the sharpshooter feet. We're just going to do this, and then we'll work our way up to that. And the, the question is, do players want that more? Do they graduate to more crunchiness as they come in as a new player? Or is it better to stay in a more simplified state and just focus on getting that narrative that that is fun out of it? And there's certainly always going to be a market for people who want as many options as possible, and they're going to make 700 characters that they're never going to play, but they're going to get that joy out of making the exact character they want. Mm. So there, there's always going to be that option, and that's, that's great. And they should be uh, rewarded with lots of options. And third-party publisher publishing <laughs> can fulfill that niche as well. Uh, but there always needs to be a focus on why are we playing this? What is the outcome? And it's that bottom of the of the hourglass. Yeah, uh, yeah. I also feel like um, I mean maybe this isn't this isn't going to be quite as good an analogy, but in terms of um, attracting new players to a thing, right? Sport, okay? I'm someone who watches sport and I need to be able to glean the basics of the rules just by watching it for like five minutes. If I can't figure out the general gist of it, then we start to hit a problem, right? So something that's super easy, you watch a a running race. Great. Whoever gets to that line fastest wins. Super easy. Anyone watching it understands. Tennis becomes a little bit more... um, Uh, difficult to glean, right? I've had people sit down, try to explain the rules of tennis to me, and it always begins with, imagine a clock. And I think that's a bad (laughs) sign, right? (laughs) You're like, there's a clock. And every time you score, you you move to 15 and then there's 30. And then the 45 is a 45, but we abbreviate it because we're French. Zero is love because it looks like an egg. You know, like 
any number of elements of tennis become really difficult to understand. I think you end up with a similar thing. And like Sean was saying, a lot of people did come to D&D via streaming, being able to see how it works and going, oh, they just roll a 20-sided die and add a number to it for mm. basically everything. There are, there are other little bits, but that is the main through line and it works that way the whole time. Once you start getting into crunchier, more complex systems, which again, it is worth noting that D&D 5e is not entirely without crunch. As much as it is comparatively quite simple, it is still, as far as tabletop RPGs go, relatively complex. But, um, you know, it's it's one of those things where watching 5e play is much easier to grab a hold of what's going on compared to maybe something like Pathfinder, particularly first edition Pathfinder. I have no doubt that second edition uh, is quite different in a lot of ways, but there's, there's a lot of stuff that you kind of have to pick up on and you start having to imagine the clock. Sorry, my brain stopped working for a second there. Goes by Gaming <laughs> News, Sean Merwin and Joe Rasso going to Gamehole Con. What are you doing at Gamehole Con, Sean? Uh, we are doing so much wonderful things. We are running a preview of the next Fables uh, adventure with super secret spy stuff going on. We'll be running two sessions each of that. We will also be doing a panel on... What does a game design company actually do and how do they do it? Uh, we're going to talk about our experiences at Ghostfire Gaming and elsewhere. And then uh, I have a couple other panels about monster design and dungeon design and if, you know, a few other things. And then just hanging out and having some fun as one does at Game Hall Con. Game Hall Con is, is unique in the sense that it's a smaller, more regional convention while at the same time having all of the guests that would be at a large convention like like Gen Con or or PAX. Uh, so, you know, you could just be sitting there and, and Matt Mercer has just walked by from time to time or Joe Manganiello has just walked by or or you know, James Hake has just walked by. Uh, and and you, know, you just see people hanging out and it's a, it's pretty good it's pretty good time. Or Sean Merwin's just walked by, which he actually will. When you're I, I will be walking by you know, a few times, probably. I got to say, I'm really excited for this new Fables installment to get playtested out in the wild, because this is really where uh, I handed off Fables to Joe Rasso. I, mm -hmm. I had the idea for this third season, um, the, the big picture, broad concept of sort of fantasy super spies, the sort of uh, the 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 mid season twist uh, that I won't say any more about. Yeah, I was about um, to say we're still streaming, James. You know that. Yeah, right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> um, but uh, the rest of it is all Joe. Um, he gathered the posse of writers to do it. He uh, did each of the individual bits. Uh, each of the individual episodes and their outlines, and uh, he's really made fables his own creation from here on out and i'm just i'm just psyched to see what people think about it it's going to be great how are you feeling about the uh the convention in general sean we just had the experience in uh with pax australia and now you're going to game hole con to have a very similar experience by the sounds of it do you enjoy conventions broadly yes i do i they're they can be exhausting especially if you have a lot of games to run or panels to do uh, but they're also energizing in the sense where you get to actually talk with the players and talk with, you know, people who consume your stuff and other game developers. And there's nothing like it, uh, in game design. You know, if you write books, you, you sort of write by yourself and then you hope people like it. When you write games, you can get out there and you can watch people play your games or you can talk to other game designers and see their stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's, there's an instant uh, feedback that comes with it that mm -hmm. is like no other uh, sort of artistic endeavor that I can think of. We're almost out of time, but I did want to answer this last uh, email as best we can, which comes in from Jason asking about magic items in 6th edition. We observed, I think, on previous episodes uh, that, you know, 6th edition, that's my word for it, sorry, 1D&D. &D. Uh, we observed in previous uh, uh, episodes that 1D&D &D seems to be leaning much more into feats and as a non-optional part of the game. Um, and so they were asking about magic items, that magic items can often occupy the same sort of space as feats in 
a game of D&D, you know, what makes a good feat can sometimes also make a good magic item uh, was their assertion. So what do we see the role of magic items being in one D&D? I'll behave myself. Uh, if feats become more um, uh, uh, core to the game. I think the major thing about magic items is that you can swap them in and out as needed. And in fact, attunement, if that system persists into one D and D means that by necessity, magic items will need to be swapped in and out as the situation demands feats for as, you know, even though there are popular retraining rules and things like that, as we've seen in Tasha's, et cetera, are generally fairly permanent and they represent a core competency of your character in the same way that a proficiency or a class feature would. Um, Whereas magic items, Hell, there are magic items you can pass around with the whole party. Uh, There are certain magic items that make most sense to stick with one person, like an enchanted weapon or something like that. But I can imagine I've been in parties where, you know, the cap of water breathing goes to whoever needs it most at the time or the 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 carpet of flying is used by the entire party because they had they all have need of it. Something like that. Um, Mm. So I, I can see. Magic items taking a more party focused uh, angle, but if I'm being totally honest, I can't imagine the magic items will change very much. There are a lot of magic items that are just core to the sort of brand of D and D. We're not going to lose a deck of many things. We're not going to lose a flame brand longsword. We're not going to lose the apparatus of Qualish. All of those things are so core to what D and D is. People expect them out of D and D that they're going to stay just like they are. Feats are feats in one D and D are now a core part of your character. There is a system for you to get them. Magic items forever have been problematic because they're not. Mm. The and and the book doesn't tell you, DM, that you should maybe limit the magic items you give, or this this is the consequence for giving magic items. So whereas feats are now a part of character progression, magic items are As far as we know, unless they do something to say, this is how often you should have a magic item, a third level character should just have one common and so on and make that a hard and fast rule. We're going to be in that nether region of hell where one uh, DM is going to say, why is this adventure so easy while sitting there with characters that have plus five reality slayers at third level? And the other you know, DM is saying, why is this so hard and hasn't given out any magic items? They are so uh, ubiquitous, but not reg- regulated by the rules. They, they do things to the math that can make a game better or worse. They do things to a story that can make a game better or worse. And so unless there's some regulation in 1D&D, uh, magic items are going to continue to be uh, problematic by by refusing uh by wizards refusing to tell us how we should use them best and tragically this is a problem that it's sort of a damned if you do damned if you don't situation because third and fourth edition did regulate magic item progression very strongly and that led to its own new host of problems where uh the gm was sort of a slave to the math and players often felt like they were on a magic item treadmill in fourth edition where it's like yes Now is when you were supposed to get a plus three weapon as opposed to the plus two you had back in heroic (laughs) tier. But of course, to compensate and keep the game balanced, all of the monsters armor classes have gone up by one. So it's like, did did it even matter in the first place? Um, Well, there's that. That, That's almost like a video gamey loot, like (laughs) Diablo style thing where the intention is you see the numbers go up and you're like, well, this sword's way better than the last one I got. But the game needs to keep being challenging. And so, you know, there, there's there's a difficulty ramp there. There's nothing in those glossaries that has referenced magic items. Nothing has been changed with how attunement mm. works. Nothing like that. Which that plus the ramping power of feats makes me wonder. I mean, 5e has kind of um, very little emphasis on on magic items and magic weapons. As much as everyone loves using them, mm. uh, the, the sort of source material does not emphasize it and does not talk talk about it. We mustn't speak of the magic items. Um, so I wonder if they're actually going to, I mean, this is pure speculation, but it's possible that they might go in the direction of just 
de-emphasizing magic items even more. I personally think that's a good move. Um, one of the reasons that people complain about challenge rating being a busted or useless system is because with magic items being unregulated such as they are, there's really no way of aptly measuring a party's power level uh, with reference to their level. But I say that even if there were no magic items, there's no real good way of measuring a party's power level with regards <laughs> to their level because there's such an enormous band of optimization and unoptimization that simply what level each character in the party is cannot even hope to begin to tell you. Um, what is a level 10 fighter's power in comparison to your uh, hyper optimized? build that dips once into warlock and once into paladin and once into monk and there's seven other levels of fighter that's not a real build um but there are so many ways of busting the math on uh challenge rating that it's, it's never going to be a perfectly functional system no matter how much you try to game design your way into a perfectly uh competent system um so just let the magic items be free range. Let them let them roam free on the wild pastures. Uh, I think the storytelling of the game will be much improved for it, and the the math will remain relatively the same. This is anecdotal, but my personal experience with magic items has been uh, they enter the game, uh, and if a GM is not kind of warned, which is what happened to me. Uh, you know, there's a plus one battle axe in uh, Lost Minds of Fandelva uh, under the Dragon's Keep, uh, which you can get pretty early if the party decide to go there quickly. And uh, once they have that plus one battle axe, like a, a fighter barbarian had it in my first party, I didn't realize this, but that was like ghosts, fiends, like anything that had a, 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 a resistance is the word I'm looking for to weapons was solved as soon as that magic item entered the game. And I, I really wasn't prepared weapons, for that. <laughs> to be yeah, honest, and damage totally. resistances. For sure, for sure. So I feel like there needs to be some regulation around or, or at least advice for, for game masters about how to regulate their magic items. And so far that mm. seems to have been the role of um, YouTube D&D uh, uh, &D commentators uh, so far. Um, and I also feel that magic items are so, as the chat's kind of mentioned a few times, uh, uh, everybody's been talking about de the, the, the de-emphasication, that's, I butchered that word, uh, of magic items. <gasps> Was and, it a word? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Um, and it, uh, you know, magic items are so iconic to D and D five E, you know, like parties expect to find magic items and players get as kind of antsy about no magic items showing up as they do uh, with not going up level quickly enough for their liking. Um, so I think that ma whether they change them or not or just keep them the same, I definitely don't think there's going to be a de-emphasizing of magic items uh, in 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 sixth edition any more than there sort of currently has been. Um, but that's just sort of my anecdotal uh, opinion more than anything. Um, but we are out of time. That's why I got distracted then. Dante pointed out to me, Dale, you have a stream coming up basically right now. So if you are watching this on Twitch, stick around because we are going to raid into Dale's uh, stream, which is going to start as soon as this finishes. I'll just wrap up the official podcast. My name is Ben Byrne here as always with Dale Kingsmill, James Hake, Sean Merwin, uh, let others know about the Eldritch Lawcast. We're here every week and we will see you next time. We were a little bit less deep on the drums. All right, I'm out of here because I'm starting on the other channel. Get see you in a bit, chat. Bye. Ba -da. Ba -da.